So my uh, uh, title is quite controversial, why audit statements are untrue and unfair. And so let me make my case about that. Uh, but I want to take you all to the medical profession first, 150 years ago. And the medical profession in the 19th century essentially was where doctors were giving things like heroin, brain salt, bleachers, and so on for medicine. Now, the doctors of that time, as you can see from, from the um, one minute uh, point options, laser pointer, let me get that. From these uh, doctors over here, you can see that these doctors come today and try to practice medicine. They will have a completely different idea of the medical profession. As you can see today, the doctors of 150 years ago will not be able to do anything in medicine today. Let us look at engineering. Engineering in the 19th century, very good mechanical engineering was, did all sorts of great things. But even those engineers today, especially when they come to the era of robotics uh, and so on, will not be able to perform in today's environment. But now let's look at our own profession, accounting, especially financial accounting. Financial accounting, essentially was where we had in the 150 years ago, what we had was what is called a T account. You had the assets on one side, the liabilities on the other, and the owner's equity. And we had total assets equals total liabilities and owner's equity. So that is now what we can see 150 years later today. We have done a lot of, lot of innovation, just like the medical profession and the engineering profession. We have really innovated Okay, and today our balance sheet is quite different. It has assets on top, liabilities and equity below. So essentially, that is our innovation that we've had for 150 years. A 150 year old accountant can come and look at our balance sheet and understand it perfectly. Rather than putting side by side, they go downwards. Now this I believe is a great shame that we have not really done anything new for 150 years. So let's look at what the situation is, to, okay, and why this has happened. First, we look at the concept of an audit. The audit is a trust mechanism, okay, as you can see in this thing, it says, in God we trust, in all others we audit. So the external audit is supposed to be a trust mechanism installed to persuade the public that capitalist corporations and management are not corrupt and companies and directors are made accountable. In other words, the whole concept of responsibility, accountability was there in the audit mechanism. So accountants, when they had the role as auditors, have cemented their status and privilege on the basis of claims that they have special expertise very, very important expertise that en enables them to mediate uncertainty and construct independent, not independent, objective, true and fair accounts of corporate affairs. So that's what accountants and auditors claim that they have. They have the expertise to do this. This expertise is claimed enables markets, investors, employees, citizens, and the, even the government, the state, to limit and manage its risk. That's what the claim is, that we can tell you how things can be done and audited and give an independent, fair, true and fair view. Now, it must be remembered that audit is also big business, very big business, okay? Take for example, Australia. We had uh, last year, something called the Banking Royal Commission. And the Banking Royal Commission was incredible in what it found the Australian banks had been doing, okay? Huge amounts of moral shortcomings were exposed in the Banking Royal Commission. Uh, people who were dead were charged interest, all sorts of, uh, they were trying to sell insurance and all sorts of things, in other words, churning. Uh, and all the banks, in fact, some CEOs lost their job, okay, because of the Banking Royal Commission. But remember that all of these banks were audited by the big four, especially. They were audited and these financial institutions appeared 
captive escape scot free despite collecting large fees from them. And the fees are not small, as you can well understand, very large fees. Auditors collect large amounts in audit and non audit fees as well. In the past decade, that's in the last 10 years, the big four auditing firms have earned $1 billion from the four banks, just from the four banks, in auditing and non auditing fees. For example, in the period 2008 to 2018, Ernst and Young earned 286 million from the National Australia Bank, KPMG earned 203 million from ANZ, and PricewaterhouseCoopers 330 million from Comrade Bank, and 248.5 from the, other, the last one, West Bank. Okay, so these are big, big numbers. So audit is definitely big business and it, it's in the interest of the auditors and maybe the accountants as well, that we need to make sure that people don't lose trust in what we are doing. So where is the conflict coming in? The recent scan, there was a recent scandal after the Banking Royal Commission, a further scandal, okay, that has now had a parliamentary inquiry into it, where the National Australia Bank one of the Australia four big, uh, big four banks has triggered a unanimous party, bipartisan support, in other words, of both sides of parliament, all sides of parliament, okay, into potential conflict of the audit firms. I mean, they, there was clear indication that they were essentially doing what the client wanted rather than what the shareholders wanted, client in terms of management. The current National Australia Bank scandal erupted when documents leaked by a whistleblower shown an embarrassing light on the private workings of the bank and the cozy relationship it had with his auditor of 13 years, Ernst and Young. Now, I'm just not creating this. These are all in the newspapers. So anyone can see what this scandal was all about. Okay, so can we hold auditors accountable if he gets uh, some big problem with our companies? Can we hold the auditors accountable for what they are telling us? The need to hold auditors accountable have been highlighted in many countries. Australian parliamentary inquiry is just one of many, many of the years that have happened. But after a few weeks of media exposure, largely ignored. And I can bet you that that's exactly what's going to happen with the Australian Parliamentary Commission. The people are too strong, okay, in terms of the, their lobbying power for these to get anywhere beyond just an inquiry. The Banking Royal Commission was one of the few success stories in Australia. Here's what the International Forum for Independent Audit Regulators, an organization representing audit regulators, by the government regulators of 49 jurisdictions, including Australia, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Spain, UK, and US. This is what they said. In 2015, they said, there are persistent deficiencies in critical audit areas related to audit work on controls within companies designed to prevent abuses, valuation of assets and liabilities and disclosure of crucial information to the public. So these are, they're saying there's persistent deficiencies. But of particular interest to Australia is that the report is concerned that auditors of financial institutions, the very ones that the Banking Royal Commission was looking at, pay inadequate attention to the likelihood of losses the valuation of investments and securities. So there was a comment made that in the financial services sector, it seems that independent report is whatever the client's money can buy. Now that is terrible if that is the view that is coming out, that whatever the client can buy, that is the audit report supposed to be independent. Okay, so all these criticism, what is the standard response of the financial accounting profession? What is the standard response? Enron's collapse, Tyco, Lehman Brothers, Enron, uh, sorry, WorldCom, all of these, what are their response? The standard response to any criticism from the auditing industry is to deny the problem. They say there's no problem, doesn't appear there, or issue new auditing standards, audit reports, code of ethics, etc. So these things promise tougher actions against laggards, the people who don't follow, but none of these solutions are adequate and they're all based on tweaking of accounting standards. So essentially, they come out with accounting standards, new and new accounting standards. Okay, they say that will solve the problem. Okay. 
But the problem is not the auditors or the companies. The accounting standards itself is the original sin. Okay, so auditors are following accounting standards, but the accounting standards are where the problem is. In Christianity, the Adam and Eve ate the apple, or in Islam as well. But in, in Christianity, they created this original sin. And in this case, the original sin is the IFRS. Okay. So who controls these accounting standards? So as I told you, the audit is based on the accounting standards. The accounting standards itself, who creates them? If the tweaking of accounting standards is the solution, who controls the body responsible for issuing these standards in the first place? There are bodies, that is, the International Financial Reporting Standards are issued by the IFRS Foundation and the International Accounting Standards Board, ISAB, IASB, sorry, which is in England. Now that sounds fantastic. There's a board, there's a government-sponsored board and all of these, fantastic. Okay. But who is the one who are the individuals in those foundations and standards boards? And overwhelming majority of CEOs and non-accounting regulators do not know that the big accounting firms have complete control over the deliberations at the IFRS Foundation and the ISAB. So the ones who are actually issuing the standards are the auditors themselves, especially the big accounting firms. They stack the board and thus effectively it control the development, production, and modification of accounting and auditing standards. Every single one, I, I can't say every single one because I haven't looked at every single one, but I would say easily 95% of those on the board have some big four connection at some stage of their lives. Okay. One has to do only look at who's who sits on the standards and oversight boards of, in Australia and internationally. So in individual country boards and the international boards. Just look at who sits on those boards and what their backgrounds are. So there's no accountability to the public. Okay. As a result, although there are numerous international auditing standards, exposure drafts, codes and related pronouncements, believe me, there are over 5,000 pages that they issue. Impossible sometimes to read all the pages. And certainly I don't read all the pages. I know that there are some academics who talk to me who have actually read all these pages. They are curiously silent on auditor accountability to the public. So they've talked about this standard and that standard, everything, but not are the auditors accountable to the public. That is not in those 5,000 pages. Accounting, auditing, and ethical standards are little more than risk management boundaries written by for the firms and major corporates by their friendlies to keep them away from potential litigation. So essentially they are written in such a way that they are, no one can sue them. Successive governments have tried, been complicit in supporting this charade, as have the regulators. Okay. They have accepted this. It's, it's in a sense one big game played at the public's expense. Surely the public should have some rights to audit quality, but they have no rights to assess audit quality at the moment no rights at all. Although the public bears the cost of audits and audit failures, it has no rights to see audit files or to make an assessment of the quality of the audit work. It is only when a whistleblower leaks documents, such as what happened in the National Australia Bank NAB scandal, are we privy to what goes on behind the scenes. And definitely it's not pretty, as you can see from public information that's available. Auditors escape liability because under most jurisdictions, under most countries, they do not owe duty and care to any individual shareholder, not to any creditor, not to any employee, not to any superannuation, which is pension scheme member, or any other affected by their negligence. There's no duty and care that they have to any of these people, okay, as the current legislation. So an individual shareholder cannot sue an auditor for giving a bad audit report. In many Western economies, the too big to close syndrome has continued to prevent effective regulatory retribution. These guys are just too big. However, interesting 
case in India. In India, under Section 140 of its Companies Act, PricewaterhouseCoopers was banned in early 2018 from auditing listed companies in India for two years after being accused of negligence in the audit work at the now defunct Satyam Computer Services. In fact, that was extended as well. Indian regulators are now pushing for a five-year ban on Deloitte and KPMG over allegations that the firm helped to conceal bad loans at the infrastructure leasing and finance services. A major infrastructure and finance group whose default last year triggered a credit crisis. So India regulators are hitting back, but that's the only country I can see that there is some push to get at these auditors to be accountable to the public. At least the regulators there are doing something. And they are going after the big firms. Okay, so what if the audit firm, what does it actually tell us about the company? When you read the audit report, what does it tell us? The audit report of financial statements uses the term true and fair <clears throat> to express the condition that financial statements are truly prepared and fairly presented. But note the thing that I'm writing there, in accordance with prescribed accounting standards. So they're only true and fair based on accounting standards. That not, they don't say they're true and fair in real life, just based on accounting standards. Such an unqualified, op, op, as such, an unqualified audit opinion of the financial statements says that the audited financial statements are true and fair in all material aspects that is, after the auditors performed the audit, they found no material misstatements in the financial statements and they were correctly prepared, but correctly prepared based on accounting standards. <clears throat> now, let's see what the audit report does not tell us. It does not attest to the value of the company as stated financial statements. So what they have is book value. And I'll tell you how they calculate the book value later. They said that this book value is true and fair, but not the market value. They don't give any opinion on the market value. They do not attest that the financial transaction recorded rose out of ethical practices. They don't go anywhere near that. They would have made profit through various things like polluting the environment, poisoning the rivers, doing money laundering, whatever. The audit does not care how that revenue came. They don't look at the ethics of it does not attest that there has been no fraud. They say, no, we don't, we don't attest to that at all. Okay, we try to test for it, but we don't attest to it. They only say it's according to accounting standards. They only attest that the financial reports are prepared and presented in accordance with the prescribed accounting standards. That's all they're saying. It does not tell us anything else. As I told you, who develops these issues, these standards? The auditors themselves. Okay, so let me take uh, something from my own university as, as an analogy. It's like the big four are setting the subject syllabus, preparing the exam paper, writing the answers to that exam, and finally giving a grade. And if there's a complaint, they are the adjudicators of the quality of their own work. So it's completely in-house, okay? Just imagine sitting your own exam and facing criticism that you can then comment on. That is essentially what an audit report is. <clears throat> now, how has this come about? There are two primary accounting frameworks that are involved in this area. Today's financial reports are prepared based on two primary accounting frameworks. The generally accepted accounting principles or GAP, which has been there for a long, long time, since the start of auditing and accounting and the newer international financial reporting standards. Believe me, both are there. And the latest report is that America is not accepting IFRS anymore, but only GAP. So it is expecting all the other countries, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Philippines, you name it, to uh, follow IFRS, but not themselves. They are only going by GAP. The audit report is flawed because the above accounting frameworks are also flawed. However, very little meaningful attempts have been made to make the financial reports more relevant for today's knowledge economy. Today's economy are completely different 
from the economy that we had 150 years ago. But the knowledge economy is not recognized in auditing reports and the counting standards. So why are financial reports irrelevant? <clears throat> financial reports have not significantly changed in their presentation format since the dawn of the industrial era or the age of the corporation. So when corporations formed, when we needed shareholders to fund big ventures without taking risks, when we had limited liability, that was the start of accounting, the modern day accounting. Okay, when I say modern in 1850. And also, that was the time that there were very, very large machines. As you saw from my <clears throat> picture of the engineering 150 years ago, very large machines, these were the assets. So land, building, machinery, these were the big assets. Okay, here are the types of machines that were the assets of 150. 50 years ago. But in this time, tangible assets such as land and machinery were the engines of growth. As a result, the balance sheet still shows that it's mainly these tangible non-current assets that drive business value. Okay. Your land and buildings, machinery, and so on. However, today we have totally different businesses. And it's even more, as you can see today with our current COVID-19 crisis, which I'll get to a little later. Today's big businesses are knowledge economy companies with significant uh, intangible assets. So we have Google, which is an intangible asset of an algorithm, Apple, okay, which has essentially the entire product range based on brand valuations, Facebook, social media, Microsoft, Uber, Airbnb, and so on. These are all intangible assets, all essentially going around the computer. Okay, huge amount of intangible assets. These are not rec recognized in current IFRS. So they will want you to look at revenue recognition and put out re meaningless standards in my mind or recognizing absolutely minute levels of revenue, but they have no idea of how to value intangible assets. Okay, so you have, I mean, this is post COVID-19, post Corona, sorry, pre-Corona, I should say, Bitcoin, the world's biggest bank, Uber, the largest last uh, taxi company, Facebook, the world's most popular media outlet, Alibaba, the world's most valuable retailer, and Airbnb, the largest hotel provider. Airbnb has no real estate, okay. Alibaba has no inventory, okay, and so on and so forth. Uber has no taxis. <clears throat> so what's happened to the assets of these companies? They are not in the traditional sense assets. So accounting reports have not evolved. We have still are uh, on the T account format, which is slightly evolved to a statement format, but nothing more than that. Okay. So this has caused a delusionary view of accounting reports. We give them far more credit than they deserve. What is a delusion? A delusion is a false belief strongly held in spite of invalidating evidence. We are getting evidence from all over the world constantly that accounting numbers are not right. But we still hold to this belief that they are of some value to us, okay? It's like this uh, little cat looking at this mirror and thinking they are a lion, okay? They are not a lion, they're still a cat. It's a delusion. There are three major reasons why the application of IFRS results in fraud financial statements and consequently why they result in meaningless and fictitious audit reports. First of all, IFR estimates the value of all assets on the company's books are values if they're sold on a piecemeal basis. So what they do is <clears throat> they look at all the company's assets, the, their interpretation assets, and sees what are their value if you sell them one by one. That's what they essentially assume. IFRS is silent on intangible assets. 
how they can be shown on the financial statement. So only the company's tangible assets. Okay. Ignoring intangible assets have resulted in widely divergent shareholder values. So actual equity value or market value is very, very different from what the audit is telling is their book value. These equity values of what the stock market says the company's worth, which is market value, is widely different to what the audited financial statements say is the company's book value. Let me give you some examples. Okay, so before we, uh, let me give you some examples. I might, I might come to this later, but the examples are say Microsoft. Microsoft has a book value that is um, 95% wrong to its market value. Okay. But still, the auditors of Microsoft, we say those statements are true and fair. <clears throat> so let's see how we add assets on a piecemeal basis. Some assets in the balance sheet can be at cost. So remember, we are adding all these assets. Huh? Some can be at cost. Other assets in the balance sheet can be at fair value. And fair value itself has three definitions. Level one fair value is the best because these are based on quoted prices in an active market for identical assets or liabilities at the measurement date. So that they say is the best to get quoted prices. But if you can't get quoted prices, then you can get fair values that are observable either directly or indirectly. <clears throat> but if you can't get even that, then you can get unobservable asset values, essentially estimates, right? And you can plug that into the valuation. So these where you get um, consultants coming in, okay, so-called valuers and valuing some of these assets, okay? So it's like, you know, you go to the bank to, to get a loan for your house and the bank says, we give you 80% of the value of the house uh, for your loan, <clears throat> and then you tell the bank, look, I'll get my own valuation, and please give me 80% of that value. The bank will say, please go away, we will send our own valuer. That's not what happens in fair value. Fair value, the, co the company hires its own valuer to value its own assets. Individual assets are liability to the value using one of these valuation approaches, <clears throat> and then they arrive to, uh, to add it to arrive at the entity's book value. The end result is a mathematically meaningless figure. Remember, you're adding cost, you're adding fair value level one, fair value level two, fair value, fair value level three. So it's meaningless like adding apples, oranges, and grapes. Okay, so let's see in graphical form what IFR is telling us to do. It tells to take some grapes at cost and then add it to some kiwi fruit at quoted prices. And then it says to take some strawberries and add it at observable values. And then to take some bananas and add it at estimated values. And then they put it all together. They put it all together. And that is called IFRS, essentially international fruit salad. That is essentially, and this fruit salad is called book value. Okay, so that's essentially what we get. And then auditors go and audit this and tell us that this is a fair value according to accounting standards, but the accounting standards themselves are based on this fruit salad. Okay, so what happened in the global financial crisis? Let's go back in history a little bit, see what happened and see how it relates to today's COVID-19 crisis. In the global financial crisis, as you know, lots and lots of subprime mortgages were there that were virtually valueless. Much blame was placed on the vagueness of accounting rules, particularly fair value accounting or mark to market, counting accounting and subprime mortgages and financial assets. At the start of the GFC, there was no market for worthless mortgage backed securities based on subprime mortgages who had by then defaulted. So if the subprimes are worthless, most often the company itself was worthless and many of them crashed like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. But 
what happened? George Bush with uh, Henry Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, the former person of uh, Goldman Sachs, they gave 700 billion bailout money. So suddenly they gave the bailout money to the that had worthless assets. So suddenly what happened? So even though there were companies that were insolvent, okay, when they gave the rescue plan, they had some value. So just think about this. If you had worthless subprime, then you, were, you could get money from the US government. And now that very money that you were getting as a bailout was considered an asset. The SEC and FASB in USA were prompted to issue a clarification on fair valuations of toxic assets. And they said, when an active market for security does not exist, management estimates that incorporate expectation of future cash flows, not, and that is the potential of the bailout money can be used. So suddenly these companies had a value, which is the bailout money. This is ridiculous. In fact, there was even a push to abandon fair value rule by the financial sector in the USA. Okay, so that was what happened. So the bailout money itself became an asset. So let's look at the COVID-19 world, the world we are in today. What will happen post COVID-19? We know that there has been massive government bailouts, far more than the GFC bailouts for USA. In USA, they pumped 1.7 trillion to keep companies afloat. Just to give you an idea of the scale, from the time they floated the dollar to August last year, the US debt, net debt was three, bit, three, three trillion. Then in August, they suddenly started printing money. Essentially, net debt is printing money, okay? They don't physically print money. They actually give some things to the banks to make use of, right? One point, so it went from three trillion to about uh, four trillion. But when the when the um, uh, uh, this COVID nineteen uh, bailout happened, uh, they were already into four trillion. They went to six trillion. So in the space of less than one year, the U.S. has doubled its net debt, doubled it. And it's all printing US dollars. And we all take in these US dollars. Okay. Now, normally in a situation like that, when the US dollar is uh, printed like that, the value of the US dollar should fall. But here the US dollar is not falling because all the other countries are using that as the currency, okay, for their own transactions. Okay, so um, US dollar is actually keeping its value despite doubling its amount of money in the, in the out, out there. Australia has now a 700 billion job key per bailout. 700 billion. Again, taking money from future generations by printing it. Okay. Okay. Without these companies, we go into liquidation. So, a lot of companies are being kept afloat by this job keeper money. Already, I'm getting calls from all our people that the money has suddenly started coming into their accounts. Okay. Um, but let's take one example of a valuation now. We have an airline called Virgin Australia, which has gone into receiverships. No one is flying. Uh, they had massive debts. They couldn't pay up. Uh, no one is going to bail them. Other governments uh, in Australia said, they have, we are not going to bail you out. Uh, Richard Branson said, if you bail us out, I can give my island in uh, the Caribbean as a surety. All these things are there. But Virgin Airlines have gone into receivership. So what is the asset value and the fair value? Should it be cost? When the aircrafts are purchased, less depreciation. But should it be market value for the assets itself? itself that's the aircraft. No one is buying aircraft these days. Even Boeing can't get rid of all its max aircrafts. So it has to be either market value, where you get bidders and there are lots of people interested, to come and give a value, but this value would be nothing to do with the fair value in the audited statements, nothing to do with that fair value. Okay, So that is the situation where it is possible. I mean, we don't even know how to account for this job keeper money. Is it revenue? Is it a 
uh, accrued expense, uh, accrued revenue. What, what, what is this? We have no idea. Okay, it's going to be very interesting that the bailout money could be used as a fair value. Okay, so the big problem is that the intangible assets are not being recognized. An intangible asset is an asset that has, is not physical in nature, such as goodwill, brand recognition, uh, intellectual property, and so on. Okay, intangible assets are only recognized by IFRS. If there are an arms and transaction that brings the value into a particular date. So if Google was to buy Microsoft, then there would be a third party transaction and suddenly all of Microsoft's intangible assets will suddenly become assets as goodwill. But why should there be a third party transaction? The market does not wait for third party transaction to occur. Further, whilst there are many difficulties in estimating fair value of intangible assets, it's almost impossible to do so with most intangible assets as they cannot be sold on a piecemeal basis. The whole value of even Virgin Australia, Microsoft, is to sell it as a whole, not piecemeal, as what the accounting standards do. So here are some examples that I told you, I have some examples of divergent values. Microsoft, June 29, uh, market value is 82.72 billion, right? Um, sorry, book value was 82, market value was 768 billion, nine times book value. Okay, Walmart, book value 77, market value 320, four times. Okay, the auditor of both companies stated that the book valuations are true and fair, then they have got it wrong in terms of market value by almost 400, 900% and 400% respectively. Now in Australia, we had a, I'm, I'm going to uh, go quickly now because I want to give some questions. We had a flammable cladding crisis where buildings caught fire because of bad um, uh, this uh, cladding in their uh, apartments, okay? So I'm going to go through this fast, okay? What happened was that the, the building guys got together, they made sure that these things are okay, they had a good uh, um, public opinion on this, okay? And essentially they tried to fix it. In Australia, family cladding crisis, a national approach to fixing the problem has been called for, which includes applying strict standards of practice to new bills, best practice regulation, protects the consumer, and government financial support for affected property owners. In the case of the audit crisis, government should ensure the best practice regulation protects companies by not allowing self-regulation, issuing auditing standards, exposure drafts. They shouldn't be self-regulated, not allowing audit accountability to be ignored in the legislation, and not allowing book valuations to be unrelated to market valuation. That is a very important thing that should happen in the future. So how to fix a problem? The one simple fix is to have three different uh, balance sheet values, three different. One, saying these, are, these assets at cost value, these assets at fair value, uh, level one, fair value level two, fair value level three. Another simple fix is to use the intangible asset problem is to bring into the books the difference between the book value and the market value as unrealized intangible asset value. So take the book value, take the market value, the difference and on balance sheet date to be brought into the balance sheet as unrealized intangible asset values. These are simple fixes, at least as a start, but not done by IFRS. One criticism of the simple fix is that it's common to see even large cap stocks moving three to 5% up and down during a day's session. True, it can move three to 5%, but not 900% and 400%. That's the important thing, okay? So that's the thing that you can do balance sheet value at market value and book value and bring it to the books. So we really need to rethink the accounting model. It's not the interest of the accounting and auditing profession to perpetuate the delusion of a true and fair view. The financial accounting and routine profession need to rethink the accounting model to fit the new information requirements of a knowledge economy. Our specific interest in rethinking the reports would be the separate reporting of assets and liabilities measured under different valuation hierarchies, the recognition and measurement of intangible assets, 
and closing the gap between market values and book values. Only then can a proper audit be conducted. Okay, so is it time for a static, mandatory strategic audit? These are linked to management accounting. Should we be auditing the future, which is a strategic audit, rather than auditing the past, which is a financial audit? Okay, so there are many, many areas that we can audit a future of the company. It's not mandatory, you should make it mandatory. Okay, what is needed is a static audit of the expected future performance and how it affects the current value not an audit of past performance and fair value of individual assets. So really more of a risk management area. Such audits are called strategic audits. Since there's evidence that businesses are behaving badly in the legal, in legal but not often unethical pursuit of higher profits and shareholder value, the key for the government to legislate that companies undertake compulsory strategic audits, to evaluate business practice beyond simply the financial reporting of the past. Now I think that Many, many companies will have to do this anyway after post COVID-19 to see where, where the companies are heading. Okay, now let me quickly finish by taking you back to the Titanic. I think all of you know what the Titanic is. The Titanic is, of course, where there were management, there were people on board and the financial accountants used to, would stand at the back of the Titanic, okay? and report on the water wake, what happened in the past. Okay, when people ask me about what's the difference between management account and financial accounting, I say, think about the Titanic. Financial account will stay at the back and see how the water is going. And the management accountant will stay in the front. Okay. As I said, there were 14 financial accounting, keeps booking books on historical transactions in the Titanic itself. Now the management accountant will stay on the front and look after I see for icebergs, a future audit. But unfortunately, there were no management accountants on the Titanic. Okay, they had actually only two humans in this crow's nest over here looking for icebergs, but even then they had no binoculars, so no no proper computers or anything like that, any log things that help them to do their work. They just stood up here and didn't even have uh, binoculars. So we really need people up here now. The Titanic sank because there were no management accountants. Okay, no management accountants. Okay, with that, I will stop and raise it for questions. Thank you. <laughs>